So um, the, uh, um, our last speaker before the um, absolutely amazing uh, simulation talk um, is going to be Dr. Moores uh, from Australia. So uh, welcome back. Going to talk with, uh, with us about uh, uh, some damage control, cool stuff, and intra-abdominal hypertension. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. It's great to see that a few people have stuck it out to the, to the bitter end. Um, so how many people here uh, have seen a patient in the last year with abdominal compartment syndrome? So a handful of people in trauma patients? One, two, three, okay. And how many people have seen patients with intra-abdominal hypertension? Should be more. Eh, maybe not. All right. Um, so for something that is, is reasonably well known, it's still something that isn't uh, um, probably diagnosed as often as it, as it could be or should be. Uh, and I think there's probably lots of reasons for that, some of which um, I showed pictures on yesterday when you look at those pictures of, of uh, open abdomens and I think it, it scares off a lot of surgeons and a lot of intensivists for that matter. Uh, and for that reason they decide not to measure intra-abdominal pressures because they don't want to be forced into a corner where they might have to decompress an abdomen. So it wasn't really that long ago um, when intra-abdominal hypertension and abdominal compartment syndrome wasn't really recognized uh, as a particular entity. Um, it was something where uh, abdomens were closed after a difficult operation, after a lot of resuscitation. Uh, pressures weren't measured uh, and patients would often, uh, some would do okay, some wouldn't do so well, some would develop multi-system organ failure and ultimately die. Uh, and it's, it's quite likely, in fact probable, that many of those patients were dying of something like abdominal compartment syndrome when we weren't really recognizing it. Uh, but we were also closing abdomens in those days. Um, Essentially, we would never leave theater without closing abdomens, uh, even if it was incredibly difficult and the, the resulting pressures resulted in, in organ dysfunction or failure. Now, the main difference, of course, between intra-abdominal hypertension and abdominal compartment syndrome is new onset organ failure in the setting of intra-abdominal hypertension. Uh, so if you've got a patient that has organ failure, that's stable, and they have intra-abdominal hypertension, that doesn't necessarily mean they've got ACS. <laughs> Uh, so the definitions are important. Uh, and uh, just a decade ago, not that long ago in fact, the definitions that we had uh, for all these sorts of, um, of these issues pertaining to intra-abdominal hypertension and abdominal compartment syndrome weren't consistent. So between different institutions, between different countries, we really weren't probably measuring the same thing, although we had a, a fair idea of, of what we were looking at. Uh, the definitions weren't consistent, uh, so we really couldn't compare experience. One of the big problems with intra-abdominal hypertension and abdominal compartment syndrome on an individual basis is that most people don't see it very frequently. If you work in a busy unit where you're responsible for um, all the sick patients in a unit, uh, in an intensive care unit, that, that would be, you'd see more of these sorts of patients uh, within your own institution, again, depending on the patient population that you have, uh, but most individuals have relatively little experience with it. And recognition, again, depending on the unit, and in my situation, the units, the intensive care units that we run are not run by surgeons generally. Uh, they're mostly run by intensivists whose uh, training and background are as uh, um, internal medicine um, specific subtypes or uh, physicians. So quite often the recognition of those patients with intra-abdominal hypertension is, is not consistent. Uh, and across different surgical groups, there's different, uh, different degrees of uh, index of suspicion uh, for finding those sorts of patients. So mistakes and errors are common, both in diagnosis and in, in terms of how best to manage them. Uh, and certainly when mistakes are made in these sorts of patients, it can contribute to, to worse outcomes. That's worse outcomes in terms of morbidity, in terms of mortality, uh, but also in terms of overall cost to the hospital, cost to the patient, <coughs> excuse me, of having those patients in ICU for a prolonged period of time or having them in hospital for a long period of time. But the early work in uh, intra-abdominal hypertension and, and ACS was primarily in the trauma patient population. That was probably where it was first recognized as an entity. Uh, and from there, it's become a little bit more um, or a little bit better understood in other patient populations. Uh, and there's no question that the, the former uh, resuscitation strategies in trauma patients played a role. Uh, that was the, the sort of cyclic um, hyper-resuscitation with crystalloids uh, that, that ultimately resulted in this diagnosis in a number of cases. So in recent years, with changes in those strategies, the number of patients that actually have intra-abdominal hypertension or ACS have actually decreased quite a bit. So much so, in fact, that um, uh, many people um, 
that do a lot of trauma say they just don't see it anymore uh, because they're avoiding it uh, by keeping abdomens open uh, prophylactically uh, or they're so aware of it that they're actually opening abdomens uh, on occasion even before patients have developed ACS. So the risk factors I talked a little bit about yesterday and what I'm going to cover today is, is a little bit on, on the risk factors but uh, hopefully a way of, of uh, finessing uh, that diagnosis of intra-abdominal hypertension and ACS and trying to determine which patients you should actually be measuring it in. Should you be measuring abdominal pressures in every single patient that comes into your unit or should you be more selective? We'll talk a little bit about non-operative strategies and some of the things that the uh, World Society has done uh, on development of guidelines and on algorithms to help. So I showed this picture or this slide yesterday. Uh, and as I said, this, this um, slide of risk factors for intra-abdominal hypertension and ACS is, is pretty comprehensive and nearly describes every single patient that you would see in a, in a modern-day intensive care unit. Uh, the big ones are this list, again, that I showed you yesterday, and those are the ones that we, we definitely know. You see a patient with any of these diagnoses, you're going to be measuring intra-abdominal pressures because you know that patient is at um, especially high risk. Um, as I said before as well, with, with, um, in modern ICUs, in, in, in trauma patients, we're not really seeing it because of the tactics that I mentioned um, um, yesterday. Uh, and we do see more in terms of secondary ACS because those patients aren't necessarily seen by that group of surgeons uh, who is very familiar with, with ACS, at least again in my environment, but many environments in Europe as well. So recognition is highly dependent on the treating team and awareness of risk factors. Um, last year, we had the seventh um, World Congress on the Abdominal Compartment Syndrome. Uh, and I'm going to go through a little bit of an update on some of the things that were discussed and presented at that meeting um, that will hopefully give you a bit, a bit of a, uh, an update and a better idea of where things are at. When it comes to recognition of high-risk um, populations, I've shown you that before. Um, we had done some work uh, in our own unit, and our ICU is actually a, a mixed ICU. So it's not just a surgical ICU, it's a mixed medical and surgical unit. It's run by intensivists, most of whom are physicians as a background, not, most of them not surgeons. Uh, and most of this work was, was actually undertaken um, by a medical student I had working with me for a year, um, who did some, some fantastic work and was very dedicated in terms of his data collection, spending uh, nearly three months in hospital, about 18 hours a day just collecting data. So the aims of the study that we conducted over that couple of months was to investigate the incidence of intra-abdominal hypertension and ACS in that mixed critically ill population. Um, and we didn't really know what those numbers would be because in a mixed unit of all patients admitted, we really had no idea what the incidence was. We knew in very specific patient populations, trauma patient populations, trauma patient populations with head injuries, trauma patient populations with pelvic fractures, with solid organ injury, we knew in, in, in many subgroups of patients what the incidence was. Uh, but not so much in, a, in, in all patients being admitted to a, a mixed ICU like that. And we wanted to see if we could develop a more sensitive tool uh, and a more specific tool um, as to how we could identify which patients we should be um, looking at more closely uh, because that long list of risk factors was, was almost all-inclusive and it would mean that we were otherwise using um, you know, extensive resources to be measuring pressures on a fairly regular basis. So we took that list of risk factors that the, um, the World Society had published a couple of years before uh, and looked over a, a several month period at all patients that were admitted uh, and all patients, of course, that had an indwelling catheter uh, so we could actually measure the bladder pressures. And within 12 hours of that patient being admitted, uh, we had collected most of their data, most of their risk factors at the time of admission, biochemistry results, hematology results. Uh, organ function, fluid balance, and intra-abdominal pressures were measured a couple of times a day for their IC, for, throughout the length of their ICU stay. Um, and what we found over that three-month period, we'd admitted just over 400 patients that we were able to include in the study. Uh, and in that group, uh, about 39% actually had intra-abdominal hypertension, so bladder pressures of 12 millimeters of mercury or more. 2% um, or nine patients developed abdominal compart compartment syndrome by definition. Uh, but a huge group of patients, 61%, didn't have any intra-abdominal hypertension at all. When looking at the patient groups uh, themselves, most of these patients were emergency surgical patients, but the significant number uh, were also um, just elective surgical patients, was, which was a bit surprising. And in fact, many of those patients, because our ICU also functions as a high dependency unit for post-op hearts, uh, many of those patients we, we discovered in a subgroup were post-op hearts uh, of patients that had been on bypass. Uh, 
It's also quite a significant number of medical patients who didn't necessarily have an abdominal diagnosis at all, who still met criteria uh, for intra-abdominal hypertension. When we started looking for uh, significance in terms of uh, those patient groups with intra-abdominal hypertension and those without, uh, certainly there was a, a longer duration of uh, mechanical ventilation and ICU and hospital length of stay in those patients that had intra-abdominal hypertension. Uh, but we didn't demonstrate, at least in that, that strict um, um, definition, a difference in ICU mortality um, or morbidity for that matter. When we actually started looking at um, all grade two, three, and four um, cases of intra-abdominal hypertension compared to patients that didn't have it or had very low-grade intra-abdominal hypertension, intra-abdominal hypertension, we then actually discovered that there was a slight difference in terms of ICU mortality between those two groups. So the patients that had more significant intra-abdominal hypertension uh, definitely had a worse outcome in terms of their ICU stay. We started looking at individual risk factors and, and which ones were significant um, and found uh, a number that were. Uh, and then we started looking at a, a model in terms of a screening tool using those, those uh, risk factors uh, and trying to determine what um, number of them would be most significant in terms of which patients you were going to look at at the time of admission uh, in terms of which ones you were going to measure intra-abdominal pressures on. We wanted, to be, wanted it to be reasonably sensitive and specific, uh, so we picked that three or more risk factors as it gave us both sensitivity and specificity that were within a reasonable uh, zone. And when we applied that then to our um, population throughout that whole um, three months, it actually gave us um, quite significant um, results in terms of sensitivity of 91%. Specificity probably not as good as you'd like, but still we weren't missing many patients that way. So that was a useful, um, a useful exercise in terms of trying to, again, um, finesse which patient group we would be looking at on admission to um, the ICU. Um, on to other things that uh, have, have made a difference over the past couple of years when it comes to intra-abdominal hypertension and ACS. IV fluid and blood strategies, we know that's had a significant uh, impact on trauma patients in general. Uh, but specific, specifically in this patient group as well, it's had quite a significant um, impact in terms of uh, we've recognized the risks of excess crystalloid uh, and also we've determined that um, the balanced resuscitation strategies with blood products and minimization of crystalloid have made a difference in terms of minimizing those patients with intra-abdominal hypertension and ACS. Uh, so much so that again in trauma patients we just rarely see it. Um, there's probably a role for TEG and ROTEM in these patients uh, and with, with their uh, resuscitation, although it hasn't been demonstrated specifically in this patient population. The, ro the role of the World Society on ACS, well, as ACS is much less commonly seen, um, the World Society has actually uh, uh, had a name change in that it was limiting itself with the uh, um, limiting itself to abdominal compartment syndrome. Uh, it was established in 2004. It's been a, a relatively small but product productive group in terms of uh, research into intra-abdominal hypertension and ACS, uh, and has had uh, a meeting every couple of years. Uh, it's morphed now into the Abdominal Compartment Society. Uh, and it's a multi-specialty um, society involving intensivists, uh, physicians, surgeons from around the world, including pediatric surgeons and pediatric intensivists. And the main role has really been to foster that understanding and foster uh, education intra, into intra-abdominal hypertension and ACS. And it's mainly been doing that through uh, promulgation of guidelines uh, and also multi-center studies, uh, both of which they've been quite involved in for a small, uh, small society. Most of the stuff has been published on the web. Uh, and I encourage you, if you haven't uh, visited the site before, to have a look. Uh, it really does help in terms of any um, research that anybody's doing or even just discussing uh, patients with intra-abdominal hypertension or ACS in terms of uh, exactly what uh, each diagnosis or which, what each definition, definition means. And it makes it much easier to compare between different groups. Uh, multiple guidelines have been published. Uh, the first was published in, in 2004, and the most recent was updated last year after the meeting. Um, these, these publications have actually really been um, uh, quite um, highly quoted and, and referenced. Uh, they've been evidence-based. The most recent uh, version was uh, updated using the GRADE methodology, uh, and Andy Kirkpatrick from Calgary is the current president of the uh, World Society, and he uh, did most of the bulk of that work. Uh, and it was a huge piece of work to go through all of the evidence that so far exists uh, to be able to um, um, produce uh, a quality evidence-based guideline like that. Um, the recommendations uh, from that process are also published on the web. You don't, you don't have to read that. Um, Non-operative management, uh, 
Probably overall ICU, ICU care and improved ICU care has made a big difference in terms of managing these patients. Um, and, and certainly attention to, de to detail in the ICU has made a difference with these sorts of patients. Um, the guideline and evidence-based aspect of things does help as well. Um, but the things that specifically have helped in terms of decreasing intra-abdominal volume are things that you would think of in terms of uh, decreasing intra-abdominal volume and intraluminal volume. Um, extra luminal volume as well, and just draining any collections that exist. All, all of those things do make a difference. Uh, but also other, other interventions aimed at uh, increasing abdominal wall compliance also make a big difference. Uh, sedation, pain relief, neuromuscular blockade, um, all the things that are on there also make a difference as well. Uh, and increasingly, and in fact I was just having a discussion with um, somebody in the audience here at the last break, uh, regarding the role of Botox in these patients, uh, and especially with uh, open abdomens that are being closed. And increasingly, uh, there is evidence for that, uh, but it's in, in its very early days. The um, website, or the World Society, has also published algorithms. And again, this is really helpful uh, for units or for individuals who don't see these sorts of patients very often in terms of how best to manage these patients algorithmically, uh, because we don't want to get to that situation where we've got intra-abdominal hypertension that's uncontrolled, uh, that's worsening, uh, where a patient is staring down the barrel of, of an open abdomen. There are lots of things that can be done non-operatively uh, that can be effective in terms of reducing intra-abdominal pressures uh, and uh, hopefully preserving organ function. We covered most of this yesterday in terms of better management of the open abdomen, but that was uh, certainly some of the work that's come out of the society as well. Uh, and certainly an improved understanding of the role of negative pressure wound therapy uh, and dressings uh, has been very, um, very helpful in terms of managing these patients who do get to the point where they have an open abdomen. Uh, and being able to close them in a timely manner has also been a, a useful exercise. Earlier definitive closure, as I mentioned yesterday, most of these abdomens should be closed within a short period of time, and the vast majority are. Uh, and uh, really that number will probably change as the, the target patient population changes and we get better at choosing which patients have an open abdomen. So in summary and conclusion, Abdominal compartment syndrome isn't seen that often in trauma patients, but certainly more in our acute uh, general surgery patients and even patients that don't have a surgical problem. It's still quite common and still quite under-recognized in some patient populations and in some intensive care units. We do need better tools to identify and determine which patients are at the highest risk, uh, and that one tool that we have been working on certainly needs a bit more work in terms of uh, development, uh, but also uh, determining how accurate it actually is. Non-operative management is uh, useful, uh, and the non-operative strategies are useful in terms of uh, um, decreasing the, the role that intra-abdominal hypertension may play in any individual patient. Uh, and the algorithms that are published on the website are something that um, I would encourage you to have a look at if you haven't before. Surgery is still uh, a potentially important component, but hopefully less so in future. Uh, and for those that are actually interested, next year will be the uh, Eighth World Congress. It'll be held relatively nearby. It's usually in, multi it's been in multiple places around the world, uh, but next year it's gonna be very close. It'll be held in Banff uh, in just under a year's time. So I'd encourage you, if you're interested, to, to have a look at the website, uh, submit your abstracts, uh, and we'll see you there. Thank you.